The church is at its best when it's multi-generational and intergenerational. The church is at its best when it's multicultural and intercultural. The church is at its best when it's multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And that's what we have in this room. And I'm so thankful and privileged just to be able to be a part of it. So I want to give you an understanding of why we're here. We're here in, in, in my mind, and I'm going to tell you my why, and, and, and Jenna's going to talk about her why. And because, let me hit. I love this verse. Men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Like, I wake up in the morning and think, I want to be one of those guys. And I think that's what we're here to do. We're here to understand and think about together as men and women what it's like to understand our times and understand what the church should do. And that's not an individual task. That's not a, an expertise task. That's not a, a particular cultural task. It's not a particular denominational task. It's the task of the body of Christ to understand the times and what we should do. And here, I don't know anything about them. I wish that, like, I wish Scripture elaborated on them. I'd like to understand more of how they got there and why they were like that. But here's what I do know about them. They asked great questions. Because no one understands the mind and heart of God. No one understands the life and spiritual movement of God. No one understands the relationship of truth and grace to the reality of people's lives without asking great questions. And that's what we want to do today, is to help you start asking, continue asking, prompt us with new questions. We'll share some of our questions with you. You've already brought questions in. We want to stir some new ones. And it's been said so well uh, by Donald and by Jeffrey. It's to continue that conversation and to build on that conversation. Here's some of the questions, some of the things that kind of spark my questions. Uh, this is Richard Kiribara. Richard Kiribara is an entrepreneurial businessman in the country of Uganda using the principles of the leadership of Jesus Christ and the gospel to teach young men and women how to have chicken farms and to begin to move into their communities to raise chickens and be self-sufficient financially, vocationally, and to spread the gospel through entrepreneurial business. The story of how he got there are Ugandan men who had a vision for what could happen if you took a young men from tribes all over Uganda and brought them together to teach them the leadership principles of Christ. It's a story of someone in Minnesota, someone in Oklahoma, someone in Tennessee who were part of his journey who made it possible for him to now stand as an emerging adult who is changing the landscape of the country of Uganda. And I want to know how to make more of that happen. I want to understand what it's like to get the resources into the lives of these untapped kingdom impact people who are all over the world. This person here, this, I wish you could, you can kind of see this, but if you could just talk with her, her name's Lynn. I met her in Sozo, which is a little uh, cafe in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. The cafe is designed to take people who live on the streets and give them jobs and work and teach them uh, the faith of Christ as they serve in a business. I met her in this little cafe with her ministry team. She leads a, what we would call a parachurch ministry team in Ho Chi Minh City to the street children of the community. There's nothing like this. There's no model. There's, there, she's not building this off of something she's ever seen before. It's just she's following. And she's following what it looks like to live the gospel in Ho Chi Minh City. And she speaks with tears running down her face about the street children she's sharing the gospel with. And I want to know how to find more and bring the resources and the opportunity and the support for people like Lynn. This is my AAU basketball team. I'm an AAU basketball coach. It's, it's something I love, it's something I'm passionate about. Uh, someday you may see a couple of these players in the NCAA tournament. They're very good athletes. And we've built an organization, a, a nonprofit called Sequoia Leadership Concepts Youth Development, where we take uh, young men and young women from all walks of life, all diversity of socioeconomic family. Half my guys don't have dads. Some of them, one of them's dad's incarcerated, another one lives without parents. Um, some of them come from very stable homes. They're all mixed in there together, private school, public school. And here's what I've learned is when you're on a mission somewhere, you can make disciples. When you're sitting in the room talking about it, it's kind of hard. And so we make disciples through basketball share the gospel with them, live our lives with them, teach them six basic maxims. Maxim number one, live and play for a why bigger than you. Life expands to the size of your why. I'm constantly talking about why are you doing this? Why are you living this way? Why are we doing this? 
And in that, we use emerging adults primarily as coaches. My assistant coach is taking them to Greensboro this weekend. He's 23 years old. Yesterday, I talked with three different emerging adult assistant coaches. One had to ask me a very hard question that took him a week to ask me because he was embarrassed to ask me. The second one needed me to just affirm, you can do this. And the third one just went through a moral failure and doesn't know what to do. That was just yesterday with the coaches. And I look for ways to find my way into the world where we can, on mission, raise up the next generation of the church. And then finally, my own family. I'm the father of three emerging adults and a son-in-law who's an emerging adult. Real quickly, this is my son-in-law, Stephen. My daughter, she could not have found a better guy. She could not have found a better man. And when I met him, he was an agnostic who did not like the church because he'd been so beaten up by it and thought anybody who had anything to do with a large church was... He, had, he, had no, he did not have any respect for that but he really liked my daughter. <laughs> and my daughter said, Daddy, he's a believer. He's just afraid to be one because of what he's seen in the church. My daughter, Jessica, who's a warrior as a social worker for urban kids in Knoxville. Unbelievable what she does on behalf of those kids. My son, Zach, you talk about people being outside the box. My son, Zach, cannot conceive that there is a box. <laughs> I've watched him over the last year try to make sense out of not being anything mainstream at all and then for the first time in his life, asked me the question, Dad, I want to meet my birth mother. Last year he met his birth mother, his full birth sister, found out his family were all musicians, which I had wanted to tell him forever, but he never wanted to ask. And now he started his own band and doing his own music and trying to figure out who he is. This is my son, this is my beautiful wife, Teresa. My son, Ben, Ben just turned 18. Uh, ben is football player, pickup truck driving, outdoors kind of kid, tough as nails. Uh, when he just turned 18, the two things he wanted to do most when he turned 18, he did. He got a tattoo and bought some cigars. So that's his thing. Uh, that young man, the power inside him is unbelievable. And none of them connect really well to my church. Mostly because they're my kids. And they need to find their own place. And there's places for all of them. But they don't care that the church is big. They want relationship. They want connection. And if you're here from Knoxville as a part of our team from Knoxville, just raise your hand. These are the folks who help us build that. These are the emerging adults, thank you guys, who are helping us do that, our interns and our residents. And I can't tell, say enough about how thankful I am for them. You know, Psalm 71:18 says, this is kind of my prayer for myself. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. I got the first line nailed. <laughs> he's never forsaken me and for some reason at 54 I'm standing in a room with you trying to figure out how to do this better I'm a, I'm a man given with great grace and it's a great privilege to be here but that's why I'm here and Janet's going to share why she's here Thanks, I'm Jana, and uh, I have my own reasons for being here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my why, and in order to tell you about my why, I want to tell you why I got interested in emerging adults, and then why I stay interested in emerging adults. And why I got inter interested is largely because of the emerging adults that you see in that picture. Um, about 2003, I decided to start a, a small group for young adults and uh, that I mostly had relationship with. I didn't know one of them very well, but they were all really capable people, really amazing people. Actually, one of them um, has a background working with Campus Crusade, leadership there. Another one um, has, is an amazing youth volunteer in a, lo had, in a local church. And then uh, another one had had a lot of experience working with YWAM and just doing various ministry contexts. Just amazing, really capable young adults. Well, um, after I started the group, what surprised me was what was going on in their lives. And in one of their lives, they were in a very deep faith crisis. So much so that they really weren't sure if they would be welcomed in this small group. And especially by me as an adult. And so uh, they weren't sure that their questions and their doubts 
were okay to be brought into a church context. Another one was in a deep crisis of purpose, is what I would say. Um, she was, uh, looked very stable, looked very together, couldn't figure out what she was doing on this earth, why she was created, what she was supposed to be doing. And mind you, she's graduated from college now and trying to figure out what to do, of course. Not at all excited about being an adult. My third person had uh, just had the whole apartment um, that she was living in burned down with the rest of the apartment building. Now this and another bunch of reasons which I won't reflect to you today um, <clears throat> put her into a crisis of provision. Does God really provide? Why would this happen to me? And how is it that I'm supposed to move forward in my life? So she you know, started backpedaling and um, providing for herself, doing as much for herself as she possibly could and uh, couldn't believe in a God who would love her enough to provide for her, unless she was doing or doing for herself. So that was, that was surprising to me. My really, you know, like put together cool group of emerging adults were all in some level of crisis. And I, I kind of had to think, step back a minute and go, <clears throat> wait a minute, what's going on here? And so that propelled me into sort of a deeper look into what is going on in this generation of people because it was different than what I had experienced. To tell you how old and gray I am, I've been teaching here for 25 years after doing 10 years of ministry in the church. And um, this was a shift in what I'd been seeing in the young adults that I'd been with for the last 30 years, especially the part of none of them were really excited about being adults because I don't know. When I was growing up, it was like, you couldn't wait to be an adult. That was what you lived for, you know? Everything was like, adult, I get to make this choice, I get to vote, I get to drive, you know? And, and uh, these people were not very excited at all about that. So uh, that's what got me interested. This is what keeps me interested. I have a steady stream of emerging adults that come into my office. Um, throughout the year. And uh, I teach classes of young adults where I see and I hear the desperation and the confusion um, and the questions that they have. But just for an example of one place, I see a crisis pretty regularly. As I had a young man come into my office the other day because he was really, uh, he, he, he needed some help is what he told me. He needed some uh, advice or assistance from me. And I said, what's going on? And found out that um, a close friend of the family, it was a, actually a friend of his sister's, had just uh, frozen to death, died, and froze, gotten into a fight with her parents, went out into the freezing weather, got hypothermia, and died. So I assumed, oh, he needs help grieving. Well. Of course, he's grieving. But what he wanted help with, what he, where he felt the most salient sense of need, was he said, could you just help me figure out how to write a good post on Facebook that I can share with the father of this girl, who's our family friend? Oh. <laughs> I thought, oh. OK. You don't even. Um, it doesn't even click with you that the thing a person needs most is your presence or your care and not a Facebook post. But that's all he knew to do at that point. And so there's a crisis of connection um, that I'm seeing in, in young adults, as, as well as these other things, as well as a lot of other things we'll talk about this morning. But what I, what I saw and what I see is I see a generation that's like sheep without a shepherd in many ways harassed, in many ways helpless. And in the midst of that, I hear the call that Jesus gave to uh, Peter in John 21 when he said, feed my sheep, nurture my sheep. And I personally sense uh, my own calling to nurture this generation, to feed this generation. 
So okay, what are we talking about when we are talking about this stage of life or this generation? Might be helpful. Now Rick and I are not trying to put up a new definition of emerging adulthood. We're just trying to gather some of our thoughts here. So this is just sort of a, a beginning uh, stab at some of how we have put shape around this stage of life. Um, so a stage of life encompass encompassing the ages of 18 to 35, marked by critical challenges in the 21st century like a reticence to and difficulty in establishing themselves in regard to adult responsibilities. Uh, I saw a study that said that a, th a third of emerging adults would say, if I had my way, I would never become an adult. <laughs> well, they're going to, so that's, that's going to be tough. Um, so a reticence there, and then a scarcity of resources globally and locally, and Rick will talk more about what that means. And then often living life with a prolonged sense of flexibility and spontaneity, and focused on exploring their options or their identity. Uh, so a very fluid, very flexible, very exploratory kind of life, which, you know, nothing up here is meant to be good or bad. We're just trying to describe a little bit about what's going on. So Rick's going to take us into uh, our first lens, the uh, lens of, oh, no, sorry. I have one more job to do before we get to that. Um, your job, which is your job, um, your job today will be to come up with a question. We're going to be kind of content heavy today. And so, not today, but this session. And so uh, we're going to ask that you come up with a question of your own that you can kind of bring into and explore at the end of this. So we wanted, to be fair, we wanted to put up just a few of our own questions. Um, because if we give you the task, we ought to do the task ourselves. So we have just four questions here that uh, are either conceptual or practical. And your questions can be conceptual or practical, theoretical, whatever you want them to be. So we just wanted to give you a peek at them before we have Rick come up and give the next lens uh, biblical or theological foundations. We are going to um, just have, and you don't have to write down, we, we're going to get a lot of content here to get us started, and then as we go through, it's going to get more and more space. Um, so, but you're going to have access to these slides, so don't be like feeling like you're a, like a very detailed kind of person, which I'm not, and you want to take all the notes, we'll give them to you, so you don't have to worry about that. And if you're not a detailed person like me, you never thought of that question, so it's okay. Um, I, I do want to go back for just a second and just say something about this uh, prolonged sense of flexibility, spontaneity, focused on exploring options and identity. This is such an important thing, because we're going to talk about entrusting here in a moment. And I, I mentioned my kids. My, my kids are deep followers of Jesus. And they love, and my relationship's great with them, and they love me, and they love many parts about their church, but I'm their dad, and they need to find their own place and way. And my uh, son-in-law is now a parish administrator for an evangelical Anglican church, and it's the perfect fit for him and my daughter. It's the perfect fit for them. My son Zach will wind up in a church that has a worship style that really fits his musical taste and heart, because that is how he connects with Jesus. It's through worship and music, and he's not mainstream, so he's going to have a harder time finding what that's going to be like. And my son Ben will connect to whatever his own mission going somewhere because if it's not going somewhere, he has no time for it. <coughs> I think he may circle back around with us one day because of the mission that we're on. But, but this is the reality of the emerging adult. And, and the, the path forward is not as clear as it used to be. And the options are, are, um, are multiple, but they also can be very, very scary. And what I want to talk about is before we get into those parts of it is just thinking from more of a theologically, developmentally um, lens and, and kind of getting a big picture. And, and my apologies, this is going to be a fast, quick overview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'm just going to give you the way we frame it, the way we think about it. Uh, this is a pic the first picture taken from the moon looking back at the Earth. And I heard a, an astrophysicist on NPR this last week describing how this changed the world of how changed forever how people thought about the Earth and the universe. Because for the first time, instead of just kind of being in your local place or maybe even kind of orbiting outside of it, you're actually seeing where the Earth fits in the broader universe and you get a bigger picture of what's really going on here. And this is what our theology and our understanding of Scripture do for us, to understand the bigger picture of the kingdom of God 
Because if you work in a local church or you're in an academic setting, it is so easy to become myopically focused on your deal, making your thing work and thinking that the center of the universe is you getting your thing done well. And forget that you're a part of a much, much bigger story. And so I want to give you four values, four things that are kind of at the heart of how we think about ministry in general, but particularly as we approach uh, emerging adults. Number one, the gospel and disciple making, a church of seekers. Um, for years, for instance, Willow Creek did us such a gift in the, in, the, in the church to help us think about reaching lost people for Jesus. And in, in its early stages and generations, Willow Creek gave us a model of how you could start to really care about lost people, not just the people who come to your church. What a gift, what a vision, what a heart, what an impact they've had on the church around the world. And what I want to say as we move forward is I want to see the language change, though, from a church for seekers to a church of seekers. And what I mean by that is we need the people of God to turn into seekers to go seek and save those who are lost with our Lord Jesus. That's who he was. That's what he did. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And as we think about the emerging church and the, the uh, emerging adult generation in our churches, I am convinced we must get away from the church as the central reality of spiritual life and the church as the gathering of people who are following Jesus who then take the spiritual reality of their lives into their communities where lost people live to be on mission. We'll talk more about that later in the day, but that's the theology and the basis behind that. Second of all, the gospel and disciple making is about story and glory. We've got to move from expertise to empowerment. We've got to move from professionalization to the people of God. And training is important. Uh, learning is important. But at the end of the day, the people who carry the gospel into the world don't go to seminary and they're not pastors. They're people with a story of what God has done in their life and who Jesus is. And they give witness to that story. John said, I've written these things so you can believe Jesus is the Messiah and believing you may have life. I've, this epistle, this work I've been called to do, I'm doing this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, authoritative, all, all those things. But in my heart, why I'm doing this is so you can believe. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the story of Jesus. And there's another way Jesus writes a story. It's not inspired like the Word of God. It's not authoritative like the Word of God. But it's compelling. It's powerful. It's meaningful. It's by His design. Paul said to the Corinthians, You are a letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, not written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. We must believe this about our emerging adults. This is what we're calling them to. We are not calling them to go to church. And they're not interested in going to church. We're calling them to be a part of the kingdom of God and to share in the story written on our hearts and to share that story. And I love the term missional. It's, it's powerful. I like the way Alan Hurst has, has contrasted attractional and missional for those of you in that vein. But I think, honestly, we could shell both those words and just talk about making disciples. Just make disciples. If that's your key, you will redo how you do church because it will be about making disciples, not about building the institution of the church. And that story is to His glory. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The believer carries around in her or his heart the hope of glory. This story of Jesus is hope. And whatever you can think and whatever you may debate and argue and, and struggle with about emerging adults, I will assure you this generation is longing for hope. And it's in, it's not in the church, it's in the people of God who are the church, and it's in their hearts. John says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Spiritual fruit. Everyone. My son, Zach, is the most, we, I've shared a little bit about that. Here's what we say in our family. Zach marches to the beat of his own accordion. <laughs> I mean, he's not he's so but there is something in that kid and when he's writing his music he is saying things about God and life that are just 
It was powerful stuff. And, and I'm watching this emerge. I don't know, you know, being a musician is a fast track to, do you want fries with that? But he is, is going to play this out. And I've told him, I said, you do this for as long as you can and you see what God does with it because it's tapping into your heart and your heart's what the world needs. The heart of Jesus in your heart is what the world needs. I tell my son, Ben, I don't care what you do, but you make sure that strength inside of you gets into the world because it's needed. Um, we in fellowship are a part of a large church. And, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, if you were to say how many emerging adults come to your church, uh, you know, we have a lot to rejoice in. 65% of our adults are under 35 years old. Um, but a few years ago, we started really thinking and praying about that. And this is, a, this is a picture of me by my house. And that, friends, is a tomato plant. That is a tomato plant. I don't know anybody grows tomatoes. I've never seen anything like that in my life. It was, it's probably what, I'm 6'2", it's at nine feet tall. Now my first concern with this is, um, we live near what's Oak Ridge. I don't know if anybody knows what Oak Ridge is, but it's where the atomic bomb was built, all the bombs were made, and Secret City, and, and so for years and years, before anybody figured out what to do with the uranium, they buried it in barrels. <laughs> So if you look just kind of to the, to the east of my house, sometimes at night, you, I think you can see Oak Ridge glow, like the whole thing, right? Well, the soil I got for this, I got in Oak Ridge. So my first thing is, you know, don't let my cat near the tomato plant. It may eat it. You know, I mean, this thing may be the, this may be the mutation that we've all feared is coming, right? I have a radioactive plant. And I thought, man, if it, the tomatoes off of it are probably like glow in the dark, which is really cool, except for one problem. It didn't grow tomatoes. There, there, there's like this little plant right here that's got tomato. I, I, there's a couple of blossoms. You can't find a tomato on this. I don't know what's wrong with this plant. <laughs> like my wife's a therapist. She might be able to figure it out. I don't know what's wrong with the plant. But here's what I do know. The thing is nine feet tall and doesn't grow tomatoes. Now what if I've got a 4,000 attendee church that doesn't make disciples? If it's about spiritual fruit, it's not about how many people come. Jesus is not going to ask me, hey, Rick, how many emerging adults did you attract to your church? He's going to say, Rick, when all of them came, did you build your ego off of them? Or did you do the hard work of making disciples so that their story could be told to the glory of God? So that my story in their lives could be told. Third, the gospel and disciple making is about entrusting to new generations. I've told Brent, who's one of our pastors here, uh, Stacy and Stephen Latham, they're kind of our, our triumvirate of uh, uh, adult disciple-making pastors. They're all in their 30s. And I've said, this is your church. I'm leading it. I'll be, I'm all about it. I'm not going where I'm not disengaged. But you have to understand, I can't figure out what needs to happen next in this church. That's your role. I am here to support you, empower you lead you, hold you accountable to the values and the gospel and the things that I should do as a leader and cast vision. But I'm telling you, you all are going to have to figure this thing out. And Brent has been a courageous warrior for us to try to learn how to do ministry in different ways. It's taken a lot of hits because when we started changing the way we were doing our emerging adult ministry for more disciple making, a lot of them just left because a lot of them, they were there for the show and it was comfortable. Not all of them. The majority of them have stayed, but a lot just left. And Brent and his team stood in that and did some hard work. So do not think this is easy stuff. And if you're not compelled by the gospel, by theological, biblical vision, you will not follow through on those things. Paul said, all the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others a four-generational vision of disciple-making. This is Jose Allison Abreu. You should go on YouTube and get his TED Talk. He's a Venezuelan musician. He said, all my life I've dreamed that all Venezuelan children would have the same opportunity I had from that desire and from my heart stemmed the idea to make music a deep and global reality for my country. And so he went to the impoverished kids who didn't have an opportunity at music education and he found the musicians who were there and he called them together to train them to be an orchestra. 
He said, I received a donation of 50 music stands to be used by 100 boys in that rehearsal. When I arrived at the rehearsal, only 11 kids had shown up, and I said to myself, do I close the program or multiply these kids? I decided to face the challenge on that same night. I promised these 11 children I'd turn our orchestra into one of the leading orchestras in the world. 11 impoverished kids, and he said, let's multiply them. Does this sound familiar to anything you've ever heard before? <laughs> and they are considered one of the great orchestras in the world. And finally, Christ's life in the world. Jesus said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 2 Corinthians, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Life in the world with the gospel. That's disciple making. That's what we're called to do. And that's what emerging adults are wired for. They're not wired for our institutional churches. Praise God. Is it frustrating and hard for people who lead them? Yeah. Yeah. Is it difficult and challenging to figure things out? Yeah. Is it hard to figure out what the educational system is going to look like in the future because they don't like institutions? Absolutely it is. And you know what it forces you to do? To ask yourself, why are we doing this? And how do we rethink, reimagine, re-envision what the gospel might mean and what the gospel could be in this generation? Emerging adults are not a problem. They are a gift. To shake people me like me up and remind us of the gospel. And that in every generation, in every culture, it is the power of God for salvation. That's the gift of emerging adults. But we have to engage them for who they really are. And Jenna's going to come and talk about that. There we go. Clicker. I'll always take the clicker <laughs> from you. I'm so sorry. There you go. He's so selfish. So, what is going on developmentally that's feeding into what we're seeing as far as how emerging adults are relating to the church or to different institutions? And I think there's some things that we know from sociology, from uh, biology, from uh, lots of different fields that can inform us a little bit about that. And so the first thing I have up here is that the journey of development uh, that an emerging adult is in is longer than previously understood. Okay, so um, we thought that the brain was largely developed by age 18. And then brain research comes out and says, no, actually uh, it's not 18, it's more like 26, 25 or 26. So uh, it, you know, Rick and I the other night um, met over dinner and went through all of our stuff and I wish you could have been for that conversation although that would have made today really long but um, he was telling me that what that means for him is that his he's because he's told you he has three emerging adults is that the three things he most often says to his children's are I love you I'm so glad that I'm your dad and why did you do that <laughs> so that frontal cortex is the major decision-making part of the brain and that's still developing so I, I don't know all of what this means as far as how is this shaping then our perception as those that work with adults those of us that are beyond 26 what does that do for our conception of the emerging adults amongst us what does it do for their conception of themselves I don't know all of what that means but I do know that uh, brain research tells us that it's longer than previous previously uh, um, known or understood. But then I'm changing the word here to experienced because not only is it longer than we knew it was, you know, just brain research wise, but also because of many things that experience of young adulthood has changed. And economics is certainly a big part of it. This is the chart right here is uh, showing you, I mean, you could tell the, what happened in our country in about 2008. Um, we had a big, big dip 
and we're still trying to work out of it. So it goes up and then down and then up and then flat and then up and then, you know, economically, uh, this is our emerging adults are coming of age during that particular time, and the uh, economic realities have fostered more um, financial dependence for these young adults on their parents. Um, we see school co costing more, but at the same time, more schooling is required if you want a good job so that you can be out on your own. And so there's kind of an economic conundrum that these students are facing. Um, there's also a different shift in how we think about you know, our, our uh, level of financial stability or our level of financial comfort. And it used to be that if you were a young adult, you expected to go through sort of these lean years where you could barely afford anything except mac and cheese. And uh, you know, you, you pretty much went to the resale store not because it was trendy, but because you had to. And now there seems to be more, culturally there's more of a trend where you want to stay sort of at the same economic level from when you were growing up all the way into your adult life. And so that means parents are uh, providing more and your sense of what you need has changed. So this quote is from a 2014 Pew Research um, study. And what, what I think is interesting is from the time that I started thinking and considering about emerging adults till now, uh, there's just been tons more research. So here's some more recent stuff. Millennials are the first in the modern era to have higher levels of student loan debt, poverty and unemployment, and lower levels of wealth and personal income than their two immediate predecessor generations had at the same age. So this isn't their only challenge. Um, also, longer than previously experienced because, in a way, our culture is teaching them not to settle down. Don't ever get settled with anything. And thank you, Steve Jobs, for letting us know that we should never be satisfied with our current device because the next big thing is coming. And we've got to have it. And I mean, it's not just him. You know, I've got Samsung up here, to be fair. <laughs> but I'm sure you've seen things. The new Apple Watch is just out. And of course, you have to have one um, because it's the next big thing. And so there's a way in which uh, we are being taught or enculturated into thinking that um, we shouldn't be satisfied where we're at. We should always be looking for the next big thing. And indeed, we find out that um, emerging adults between the ages of 18 and 30 are changing jobs between seven and eight times. So it's affecting more than just their economic life. We also see that it's being longer than previously uh, developed because, or experienced um, because of the way they're defining themselves. This Pew study also brought out, I used a phrase, unmoored from their institutions that I thought was interesting. But what I have up here is a description of how they see themselves. And um, so at the top, supporter of gay rights has increased. A patriotic person has decreased. And a religious person is the one that's decreased the most. So from 61% in the silent generation to 36% in the millennial generation. So they don't see themselves as being people who go to church or people who are connected to churches. That's also affecting um, that I'm not settled anywhere and unmoored from institutions. It affects not just our physical institutions, but also things like the institution of marriage. Um, they're half as likely to be married as their parents at the same ages. And so 65% uh, at their age, down here all the way to 26% in 2013 for millennials. And that's just another place they're not feeling settled, they're not being settled. So this developmental journey, or the things that they're experiencing as they develop as adults, in this world is affecting the way that they enter into their relationships. It's affecting the relational um, contexts that they're in. And so if we just even think about the context of the church, um, what emerging adults you know, uh, find in their churches, you can see things like, well, some churches still have single groups. Some have pretty big, successful single groups even still. But there's a, a single group place that you know, where you can treat emerging adults as a homogeneous group. Okay, we're meeting our, home, our emerging adults because we've got a singles group. 
So we can just put them there. Or maybe sometimes churches are uh, treating them a little bit as cheap labor. Oh, they don't have a family, you know, and more and more of them don't have a family or aren't married longer and longer. So we've got more and more cheap labor. All right, cool. You know, we've got people, we've got bodies we can put into our ministry positions that need help for volunteers, etc. Or sometimes the church may see them as um, just preoccupied by their education. Now, of course, they are because they're getting more and more education. They're probably the most educated group um, of, don't know how I did that, um, of generations before them. And uh, they know that there's a correlation between education, how much education you get and your economic success. And so they're getting master's degrees and doctoral degrees and um, going on and getting more training and education. So they are truly preoccupied, in a sense, by that. But that also keeps them very mobile. So if you're in a church and you're thinking, you know, let, uh, I've got X amount of emerging adults and half of them are in school, that probably also means they're mobile, right? So they're not going to be here that long, so I don't need to pay attention to them all that much. We'll just kind of mark time with them and then they'll move on. Because we know they'll move on, so what do you do with that? This uh, developmental stuff is also affecting the way that they relate to each other. Their relationships with each other are affected in a number of ways. So the first thing I have up here is um, <clears throat> diversity in lifestyle. Now, I'm going to say these three categories have always been in the church. Okay, there's always been, what am I doing wrong? Back here. I'm, I'm fixing the bad noise. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, so um, the diversity, there's always been young adults or emerging ad uh, young adults that are unmarried. There's always been young adults that are married and married with children, okay? But now, it used to be that the unmarried young adults were the minority. So you stick them in a singles group and there you go. But now you've got a big chunk of unmarried, no kids, uh, single adults, and you've got a chunk of married adults, and you've got a chunk of married with children and adults. Before you took the other two chunks and you just put them in with all the other, you know, family, family ministry, we're all about that, right? Um, now there's uh, so much diversity felt because the chunks are bigger, especially the single one that they don't even know really, how do I relate to my peers? What, what do I, I have a good friend now who has, who's married and has two kids and I'm still, I'm not even dating. You know, and so they're uh, struggling with how to relate to each other. They also, of course, have the struggles that our technology has brought to them about how do you relate um, in deeper levels. They, studies are showing that they have less friends. You know, they have more Facebook friends, but less face-to-face -face friends. And they're also showing that <clears throat> they're having a difficult time working through the deeper issues of how do you stay in relationships that are deep and close. How do you deal with difficulties um, together? And then finally, um, we've got this delayed marriage <clears throat> excuse me, syndrome, syndrome, I don't know why I just called it that. Um, <clears throat> the delayed marriage phenomena, there we go, uh, that's creating tension between the men and women, single adults that are in our churches, because how do we relate to each other now? We're single, you know, and we're growing older together, we're get, growing into adulthood together, but what do we do? Do we kiss dating goodbye? You know, do we enter into the cultural friends with benefits thing because I'm a sexual being and I have needs? You know, do we uh, just try to somehow figure out how to live in the gap of, okay, I'm not ready to be married yet, but, I'm, but someday I will be. And so I just kind of maybe live with the gap of, of that marking timeness and how do I relate to people there? Or, you know, do I enter into online dating? Or there's just a lot of confusion and angst and difficulty in how do we relate with one another um, in this sort of uh, stage of singleness. And then finally, 
Relationally, we have the intergenerational relationships. Um, <clears throat> I read a, a really interesting article that said, what emerging adults don't want is a hip and trendy pastor. What they do want is connection with older adults that have more wisdom than they do. Hip and trendy pastors are a turnoff. Hip and trendy churches are a turnoff. Hip and trendy pro programs are a turnoff. Relationships are what they need, want, and desire from us. So, which is wonderful. The question is do we have older adults who are ready to relate with our emerging adults? And then um, I also think that what's interesting to realize about these intergenerational and intergenerational relationships is that, okay, so if you're an emerging adult and you want that, maybe you'll go to a church to see if you can get some of those kinds of relationships going, but at the same time, um, they're not going to get it from an upfront program, one-size-fits-all church, okay? Because what they're used to, uh, and what we're getting used to, too, I'm, I'm, I don't want to just put this on emerging adults, is we're used to Pandora or we're used to uh, services like Stitcher where we can personalize our news or services like Netflix where you don't have to just watch what is on TV. You can just record things or you can go and look, you can you know, watch a whole series whenever you want to, you know, and things like that. So everything is really personalized to our own tastes. And a one size fits all um, church would not give them that experience, but a relationship with an older adult would. But is there a place for that in the church? Is there a place where they can um, come together and relate that way? All right, so Rick is going to look at some kind of macro stuff with us today. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't do the timer. So I, um, I'm, like, I'm perfectly qualified to be the non-hip and trendy pastor, so that's the good news. <laughs> I get reminded that all the time. My son, Ben, a couple years ago, I, I, I'd gone to American Eagle to buy a pair of jeans, and they had T-shirts on sale for $5. I'm like, dang, you can't beat a T-shirt for $5. So I got an American Eagle T-shirt. And we were having a dinner, and a bunch of his friends were coming over, and we were all there. And, and I came downstairs, and I was wearing my jeans and my $5 T-shirt. And, and my son, Ben, took one look at me and said, go upstairs and change right now. <laughs> I said, what? He said, you cannot wear that. That's what I wear. Go upstairs and change right now. <laughs> All right, so you've been like drinking from a fire hydrant, right, on this stuff. And uh, we're going to start uh, the second session with questions and dialogue, and we're about to get to that place. And the other thing you're dealing with is one of the presenters is a preacher, so I always go over time. So I'm going to take this part here. I'm going to condense it a little bit. The slide, there's some content here you can get later on the slide. So if you see me skipping things, there's intentionality to that. Because I want to take just um, about four minutes here and just give you some big picture highlights things, and then Jana's going to bring us to closure on this. Uh, when we think of like on a macro level sociocultural, uh, there's a lot of research globally and locally and all over the place on the vocational realities of millennials, the relational realities of millennials, and the educational realities. The vocational realities are because people who are leading business, America is about to go through the largest transfer of wealth in its history between the boomers and you're handing it off to millennials. And people are like freaking out because they don't do things the same way. So there's tons of global research, not just in America. Uh, educationally, we know that education as it currently exists will not exist in the same way exactly in 20 years. It's impossible. So what's going to happen? And then relationally, we see so much. Let me give you a quick overview of those subjects, skipping a few of the things that are in my notes. Um, first of all, from a study done by PwC's Next Gen Study of Global Workplace, uh, the Millennial Report, Millennials or emerging adults in this generation value their personal life over excessive work payoff. In other words, they are not willing to sacrifice life to get more money and more stuff. It's just not their value. It's not like the boomers. Work for them is a thing, not a place. It's something you go do. It's a part of your life, but it's not like you're not making yourself at home in your work. As a matter of fact, you'd be very comfortable to switch jobs at any place. You desire a team, and, you, and emerging adults want to be in a team, and they want it to be interesting. They're more similar than dissimilar. They're not like, it's not like emerging adults are a totally different animal. It's just the way they enter into things and, and calculate things and evaluate things are more along these lines. There's a greater congruence within the values of emerging adults within the West 
than in the rest of the world. So Western culture is more congruent, consistent than other places where cultures may be more differentiated, particularly in the East. And one of the key values is fulfilling over secure. Now later, we'd have, if we had time, we'd think about if that's true, then what does it look like when we're asking emerging adults to serve in the church? Because we're asking an adult, emerging adults to serve in the church is very different than asking a boomer or a Gen X. This was a study uh, of frequency of terms. And from 1985 to 2005, this is where the, use, the term secure career could be found in the literature. And from 1985 to 2005, here's where the term a fulfilling career could be found in the literature. So when we're thinking about them using their gifts and who they are, it's going to need to be fulfilling. It's going to need to be meaningful. It's going to be a lot of times in teams. The second thing I want you to do, we could say a lot about them relationally. I'm going to focus on, on one thing from Christian Smith's Lost in Transition because we deal with this all the time, all the time. I could tell you so many stories on this. Merging adults can jump into intimate relationships assuming that sex is another consumer item, relational thrill, or lifestyle commodity, but many of them soon discover the hard way that sex is much more profound and precious than that. They feel they have lost part of themselves that they cannot recover. Some have difficulty trusting in a new relationship. Others become indifferent or hardened to their own feelings or those of others. Not far below the surface appearance of happy, liberated, emerging adult sexual adventure lies a world of hurt, insecurity, confusion, inequality, shame, and regret. And in our book, we describe the emerging adult sexual scene as a battlefield after a slaughter. And if you don't understand that part of it, you're not going to make very far in disciple making. If you can't engage this reality, you will not go very far in disciple making because this is their reality. One study says this, replicating the pattern of change among adults, trust was at an all-time low in 2012 among 12th graders. For example, 32% of 12th graders in 1976-78 agreed that most people can be trusted, but this figure sunk to 18% in 2010 to 2012. That's a 44% decrease in trust. If you don't understand the trust issues are in the room and how they're often related to sexual experiences, you will not go far past getting emerging adults to come to your programs because this is the reality of so many of them. And then finally, educationally, this is a great article. You should look this up. The three most important questions you can ask your teenager on the Huffington Post. Huffington Post has no conservative right-leaning tendencies at all. So we're not talking about Christian articles here. A large-scale survey from self, this is quoted in the article, a large-scale survey found self-reports of emotional well-being have fallen to their lowest levels in 25-year study. 50% of college students report feelings of hopelessness. One-third reported feelings so depressed it was difficult to function in the last 12 months. They are stressed out, overpressured. They exhibit toxic levels of fear, anxiety, depression, emptiness, aimlessness, and isolation. And again, not from a believer. We have raised a generation of kids who are taught that appearance is more important than substance. Outcomes are more important than character. As a result, they inhabit empty vessels that lead to a series of negative behaviors that results in, yes, unhappiness, which they try to erase with empty sex, drugs, alcohol, and what uh, pr Professor Derezovitz calls junior careerism, Hobbesian competitiveness. The hookups, drugs, and alcohol, of course, just make the abyss deeper and wider. This has got to be a part of the reality of how we engage this generation. And Mulligan says these, these are adapted by me. Three questions that you need to ask your students, your young emerging adults. Who tells you who you are? What is your purpose and vision for your life? And what is your plan for getting there? Anybody have an idea where you might turn for those answers? Like anybody got a thought on like the gospel? <laughs> they are such a gift to us because they are looking for the gospel immediately. They're looking for some hope. And Jana will close us out now. There you go. All right, so I think these three questions are great. My question is, in the local context then, will we get the opportunity to explore those questions with the emerging adults that are amongst us? And locally, we have to think about um, who's in our churches and who's not in our churches. Uh, we're seeing a drop in, in church attendance amongst millennials. You see, in fact, that 2 in 10 people under the age of 30 believe that attendance is important. That means 8 in 10 believe it's not important. 
and um, one third of millennial adults take an anti anti church stance. Okay, so. I feel like we've already alluded to this, but there's an intuitive allergic reaction to institutions in general. And um, church certainly falls into that and very much you know, is a part of what we are, are dealing with. And so if we're going to reach beyond this allergic reaction, it's got to be relationally. It's got to be with relationships within the church where, that are intergenerational, that are authentic, that are face-to-face, -face, and that can uh, break down some of what they feel allergic to. This is a quote from, a, from that article I mentioned earlier, Millennials Need a Bigger God, Not a Hipper Pastor. I think it's a great quote. Um, millennials have a dim view of church. They're skeptical of religion, yet they're thirsty for transcendence. When we portray God as a cosmic buddy, we lose them because they have enough friends. When we tell them that God will give them a better marriage and family, it's white noise because they're delaying marriage or kids. When we tell them they're special, we're merely echoing what educators, coaches, parents have told them their whole lives. But when we present a ravishing vision of a loving and holy God, it might just get their attention and capture their hearts as well. So a dim view of church versus a ravishing vision of a big God who is transcendent, who loves them. Um, I feel like this can't just be a good preaching topic that we pursue. It's got to be a way that we live in close proximity. And uh, I, I recently was at a conference in London, and this woman, Sarah Brush, was talking about development. She brought up the fact that development is a lot more like trees, because they go through seasons and things like that. But she also talked about the idea of scaffolding, of uh, having um, support that's not too close so it doesn't squeeze out the life of that tree but is around that tree in order to help give it shape as it moves into its maturity um, and I feel like that's what we've got to figure out as churches we have to figure out these two things how do we present a ravishing vision how do we stay in close proximity to our emerging adults in the local church Amen. so now comes the time where we're gonna we're going to turn it over to you, and we'll turn it over to Don in just a second, and ask that you um, think about your own question. We're, we're creating a Google Doc here where we can kind of gather all those questions. So if you have a device with you, please ask that question right on that Google Doc. And if you don't have a device, if you want to turn to somebody who does and say, could you put this question up for me, that would be great. Rick and I are going to take a look at that uh, during this next little section and, and the break and hopefully uh, maybe address a few of them, but it's at least a way for us to gather some of our questions together. So thank you for your time and uh, over attention to, uh, I think we went a couple, 10 minutes over, so back to you. Thank you.